is how to monitor a satellite and Thomas Schmeinder. So the title is a little bit different than what I originally thought it would be, and that's thanks to one of my colleagues and my manager kind of reviewed the content. I needed some kind of concept to tie the whole thing together, so we came up with uh, Nagios Core from terrestrial to celestial. It kind of tells the story how we took Nagios from our basically data center, mission control center, to uh, space, and we'll talk about that today. So I work for Boeing Information Technology. I've been there 16 years. Um, anniversary is a couple weeks ago. Seems like a long time, but when you look at the lifespan of a spacecraft, they're about 15 years, so you quickly lose track of time. Very easy to do with all these different programs. Um, my official title is First Tile Technologist. Kind of hard to explain, but it kind of means I do a little bit of everything with lots of different technologies. Um, everything from IT to spacecraft. For the last 16 years, I've been supporting the Satellite Development Center. This is located in California, El Segundo, and it's the largest satellite manufacturing facility in the world. It's pretty amazing. The place is huge. Um, we build, produce, design satellites, and put them up in space for our customers. My primary responsibility is the Mission Control Center Computer Operations Lead. A lot of words basically means I manage a small group of people, actually four, that perform the job of delivering spacecraft on orbit to our customers. And that's what our Mission Control Center does. It basically takes from the launch of the launch vehicle to delivering it on orbit. We command, control, and operate the spacecraft perform on over tests and deliver it to our customer. The other area that I support is our Customer Operations Support Center. Um, this is another organization that is responsible for taking the spacecraft from on orbit to the end of its life. We support our customers, um, provide them the knowledge and the skills so that they can operate the spacecraft for the amount of time that they're going to have it in orbit. So whenever they need a in assistance or I have a question, they'll call us up and say, hey, can you give us a hand with this? We see something that doesn't look right, or maybe they want to do something different. Um, so that's what that organization does, and that's what we're going to primarily talk about today. To date, I've supported 44 spacecraft over my career. A couple of the guys I work with have been there about 10 years longer than me, maybe a little bit more, and they've supported well over 100. That's a lot of spacecraft. It's kind of cool to think that you've played a part in putting 44 objects out in space. It's pretty cool. So terrestrial to celestial. So this was our concept of where we were 10 years ago and where we're going today. Um, it was about 10 years ago that we started using Nagios, and that was kind of an interesting evolution unto itself. Up until then, the only way we really monitored anything was either my guys were on shift during operations or we had a flight director who's there 24-7 monitoring the spacecraft, sitting in front of a screen, watching what it's doing. And that can get kind of boring at times and there's not a whole lot going on. So it was kind of a reactive model, um, unfortunately. We kind of learned our lesson the hard way during a couple of our shifts, we noticed that one of the systems lost the CPU. It took almost a full day to figure it out. Just happened to look at our checklist and saw that one had two CPUs, the other had one. It's kind of embarrassing to go and tell the mission director that, oh, uh, excuse us, we have a problem. And a couple of weeks later, another incident happened. Looking at our systems, one had more memory than the other. Had to take a break in the action, open up the system, found the memory sitting at the bottom of the system. So we realized we needed something to monitor our environment, especially a critical environment like this. So during one of our compatibility tests between the Mission Control Center and our factory with uh, the spacecraft, I was talking to the test engineer, and we had a little break in the action. I told him what happened, and he said, you know, I heard about this software called Nagios. You might want to look at it. So we did. We did a couple of trades with some other monitoring software packages at the time. 
and Nagios just struck a chord with us. It seemed to give us everything we wanted, give us the flexibility, the customizability, and our environment tended to be dynamic. We, we tended to change operating systems and applications quite often, so we needed something we could keep evolving and growing with. So we ended up using Nagios for the last 10 years monitoring the control center, our connections to our antenna sites around the world, the usual storage network stuff that everyone pretty much monitors. And that was, that was great, it works great. It allowed my team to de-staff some of our mission support during quiet times, so we only had to be there during critical times. So we could go off and do other stuff while our system was being monitored and notified us when things went wrong or could potentially go wrong. So going forward to our COSC customer, our internal customer, we started looking at monitoring spacecraft on orbit, which is something I've always wanted to do, but never really had a good way to do it or a good case for it. Part of what changed, too, is we evolved to another generation of our application, which turned out to be built in-house, which gave me the leverage I needed to request the decent API so we could get data out of it and kind of move forward with this concept. So today we're going to talk about what a satellite is, why we'd want to monitor one, and how to monitor it, along with some of the guiding principles that we use in these projects. So if you're a test engineer in a factory, that's what a satellite is. It's this big device that you work on every day, all day long, for almost a year and a half, building, putting together, testing. Um, the picture is, shows the spacecraft in a horizontal position. So throughout the manufacturing, they'll move it, change it, so they can reach different parts and pieces of the spacecraft. This one's nearly complete. Uh, you can see the solar panels on the side there. You can see some of the antennas on top. These things are pretty big. I wanted to give you guys kind of an idea of the scale of them. This one's all packed up right now because it will be going on top of a rocket inside a fairing. But when they deploy, they all spread out and open up their wings. Some of these have a wingspan equivalent to a 787, to give you an idea, idea of the scope. But a satellite is something that orbits another object. So NASA has their definition, which I'm sure we've all heard in school and seen. Um, a satellite is a moon or a planet. We're all familiar with uh, the moon. That's one of the most popular and noticeable satellites out there. But of course, we build machines that go around the world. And that's, that's our core business, and that's what we like to do. In the background, you can kind of see one of the spacecraft. They're all deployed. Uh, not to scale with the Earth, but you get an idea. Here's our current product offering for our spacecraft. They come in different shapes and sizes and do different things. Um, the one on the right with the big, big antenna, we will be launching one of those on Friday. If you're interested in watching the launch, it'll be launched from the Cape through United Launch Alliance. And I think liftoff is around 3.02 a.m. Pacific time. So if you want to see that happen, it's pretty cool. I never get to go to the launch site to these, see these things because we're always at the Mission Control Center waiting to take control once the rocket does its thing. Next to that is our high power, which is the HP. Then you have a medium power. And going down to the left, you have a small platform. Some of the terminology is kind of interesting. Um, we tried to scale our spacecraft to meet different customer needs. For quite a while, we were selling primarily the high-power spacecraft, but some of the smaller customers didn't need a big, powerful spacecraft. They just need a small one. For uh, those interested in geeky stuff and technical specs, here's how these spacecraft kind of kind of line up with each other. In the left column, you'll see payload mass and power, and that's kind of how we scale our spacecraft. Either they're high power, medium power, kind of low power. On the right-hand side, you'll notice that the weight, the actual spacecraft weight or mass is pretty consistent. There's a pretty solid range in there, and that's driven by the launch providers. So rockets can only carry so much, and we try to optimize our spacecraft to meet what the customer needs. So some, some interesting stats. Um, 
first one up there in 1999, that's when my career started, and I was around for the very first launch of, launch of the HP, which was pretty exciting. It's still out there doing its job, and hopefully it lasts a little bit longer. Now, I put this chart together. It's kind of hard to read, but I wanted to give you guys the scale and scope of which and where these things go. There's a lot of stuff out there. The spacecraft we build are typically stationed out there in a geostationary orbit, which is way over on the band between, or actually at the spot between the green and red. So they're out there 22,000 miles away. That's, that's a long ways. They can take either two weeks or up to 12 months to get there, depending on which spacecraft and what kind of propulsion. But the reason we do that is we want to get into this orbit that you see on the right, which is the same orbit time as the revolution of the Earth. So the spacecraft is always pointing at the same spot on Earth. Um, and there, there's reasons for that. Obviously, you want to have um, television broadcasts constantly. If there are any lower, you would only see the spacecraft for small periods of time. Uh, if you look at the blue range, that's where the low Earth orbit satellites are, the ones that you can see at night. And then kind of in the middle is where the GPS satellites live. They're in a medium Earth orbit. And on the bottom, you can kind of see the scale between the Earth and the Moon. You'd think these are quite a ways away out there at 22,000 miles, but compared to the Moon, they're still pretty close to Earth. Now, one of my colleagues mentioned that we may be monitoring one of the devices that's the furthest away from Earth which uh, is a pretty cool concept when you think about it. I don't know of any, anybody with the data center that far away. <laughs> kind of a cool concept. The only problem with that is if something happens out there, not a lot we can do about it. So these systems have to be robust, they have to be redundant and last 15 years, which is also a challenge from an IT perspective. So why did we go through all this effort when we had systems that we could sit in front of and watch stuff? Well, our customers' requirements kind of changed. They want, wanted better support. So a couple of years ago, we put together a system to monitor on-orbit spacecraft. It was like our standard mission control center system where if you really wanted to watch it, you had to sit in front of it. But if you stepped away, you had no idea what's going on. So this did give us some capability to watch what's going on with the spacecraft and react before our customer calls us up and say, hey, I think we have a problem. But it still didn't give us what we wanted as far as monitoring goes. Um, the other part of, of why we'd want to monitor a satellite is with our newer product line, we have longer mission durations because of the time it takes for the spacecraft to get on orbit. And we'll talk a little bit about that further in the charts. And then lastly, our advanced satellite control system that we built didn't have a monitoring notification cap capability. In fact, the only capability it had for those were our flight director or my team when they were on staff. And that just, that was more reactive than proactive. And with these longer durations, you don't want people sitting there for months and months and months just watching paint dry, essentially. So, how are we gonna do this? So you need a couple things. We need a satellite, which I happen to have a few of those. Um, we need some telemetry, which is the data that comes from the spacecraft. We have an application, which is our advanced satellite control system. Then we need another application to monitor and notify us, which is Nagios. If you look, I know it's kind of hard to see, but in the background, you actually see a couple of spacecraft in what we um, call our thermal vac chamber. So that thermal vac chamber simulates the environment in space. We create a vacuum, heat it up, cool it off, test the spacecraft, make sure it's happy and healthy. This one can actually hold four of these spacecraft. It's pretty huge. So here's our spacecraft out there in space. It's actually a lot smaller in reality, but for purposes of this presentation, it has to have some size. From the spacecraft comes telemetry. This is the data that we need to do our job in monitoring and making sure the spacecraft is okay. And this data is primarily, primarily focused on the health of the spacecraft. Um, 
The spacecraft is built in two pieces. There's a bus and a payload. The bus is the part that gives it all the power. It provides the thrust. It gives everything that a payload would want in need in life. So we monitor the health of the spacecraft using telemetry. Um, here's the definition I found on Wikipedia. It's really a whole bunch of measurements of the vehicle and the payload that come down to us every day, all day long from the spacecraft. So what we'll do is we'll take that data and we'll put it into our system, which is our advanced satellite control system. That system will decommutate the telemetry, which means it converts it into stuff that us humans can understand. Um, kind of like taking binary bits and turning them into ASCII characters so we can read or understand the data. This could be a voltage, it could be a thermal temperature, it could be uh, information on if the payload's turned on, turned off, that kind of information. So it can actually be a lot of data. So because of that, I ended up having to set up instances of Nagios along with each of the servers that ran a spacecraft. A couple of reasons why I did that is because we have multiple spacecraft, and I was concerned about performance at the time. It just made sense to co-locate them together and let them work together right there on the server. So what we ended up doing was creating a local check routine that subscribes to our ASCS software, which has a message bus, I believe it's Glassfish, and that really is a challenge unto itself. Um, so we found out that passive checks were the only way we could really manage that data. Because once we subscribe to the data, we just get flooded with it, which is fine, and passive checks work great for that. Um, one word of advice, if you ever have the opportunity when you're meeting with vendors or in-house developers, please ask them for a robust API that you can get data out of the system and do your monitoring if you can, or make it a requirement with your contract with the vendor. It's very helpful. Good, bad, or otherwise, when we developed ASCS many years ago, I was not very knowledgeable about APIs, so the API we ended up with was challenging to work with. But fortunately, our ASCS system handles spacecraft information very much like Nagio, so it just made sense to put the two together. And with passive checks, we can check a lot of stuff very easily, very quickly. So that got our data on the ground and got our spacecraft being monitored. So I ended up having to install another instance of Nagios, and this one is kind of our global server. It really takes a look at the health of our overall system and it keeps track of each of these instances of Nagios that we've got for the spacecraft. So we kind of created a distributed kind of concept. And to tie it all together, we ended up using Make Life Status or MK Life Status. Um, it provides the query language. We're still running an older version of Nagios, the 3.5 version. So it was kind of what we had to lean on to get the data moving forward through our system to our engineers to view it and also my team. Then we also introduced the, the multi-site portion of um, the MK stuff. That was great because now we could see everything that we wanted to over all of these instances. It brought an aggregated view forward. We could see what's going on with the overall fleet, which was the next iteration. That's not the actual number we're monitoring right now. It's actually quite a bit more. Uh, but that's pretty much all I could squeeze on the chart. So now we have this whole on-orbit fleet monitoring capability, which is amazing. Um, here's some of the details of that system. So as I said, we deployed an instance of Nagios per spacecraft. And because it made sense, and also we keep adding spacecraft, and spacecraft go away over time, so it's an ever changing environment, even though it may take 15 years for that cycle. We're currently monitoring 17 on-orbit spacecraft. Uh, I think that started with the HP product line. We still have a lot of older spacecraft, but they are nearing the end of their lifespan, so it didn't make sense to try to pull all those in. But even so, 17 plus another two or three coming up here before the end of the year, which will bring us up to 20, we're still monitoring quite a bit of stuff. 
Uh, passive checks can range from 8,000 per spacecraft to 20,000 per spacecraft. And when you add that all up, I think when I looked before I left, it was, he has over 221,000 data points we're monitoring over this fleet, which is a lot. It's, it's hard to kind of wrap your mind around at times. So the challenge, challenge there is trying to keep thresholds correct throughout each of these spacecraft. Good news is, is that our application takes care of that for us. It, it handles those thresholds and it'll pass along whether or not one of those data points is in a warning or critical condition. Um, MK Live status was used to pull all that stuff together. We also use it to grab some of the uh, status and history data so we can feed that to the managers to give them kind of a, an overall status of what's going on. Primary operating systems right now, Fedora is being used for the Nagios kind of global server, and our ASCS product is currently running on Solaris. Fortunately, the next two spacecraft we're going to move on to the system will be running Red Hat Linux, which will make my job in life a lot easier. And then we can start transitioning towards Nagios 4 and get the 3.5 out of the way. But until then, we're going to have kind of a mixture of stuff. What's next? Well, our current product line, uh, or current addition to our product line, is the 702 SP. So it has the designation of being one of the first all-electric propulsion satellites. No longer do we have to use oxidizers and liquid propulsion to get spacecraft on orbit. We can use electric propulsion. From the customer's perspective, that's a huge gain because it makes the satellite lighter. Um, since there's less fuel, they can put more payload on it. Uh, electric is a lot more efficient, just like your hybrid cars. The downfall is it takes a long time to get out into space, almost a year. So once we get all the critical activities finished on the spacecraft, we have these long durations where it's just kind of slowly putzing along out to space. And that's where using something like Nagios with our system made our job a lot easier because we can start de-staffing those long periods and let the system handle monitoring and let, them, let it notify our engineers when they need to come in and look at it. So we put a lot of faith and trust in that capability to provide this kind of functionality to, to our engineers and our customers. Um, we've also used the event handler quite a bit to introduce a lot of automation. So as we're starting to de-staff and automate more, that event handler becomes more and more critical to us. So the current implement implementation I have is we have Nagios watching our telemetry connections. And when it detects we've lost telemetry for whatever reason, if it's a network outage or the antenna site lost track of the spacecraft, we'll try to reestablish and reinitiate that connection automatically in that contact. So from time to time throughout the day and even weeks, I'll get a notification once in a while that we lost connection, but it recovered right away. And that's what that event handler is doing for us. It works great. So right now with this product, the engineers only need to come in for like a three hour pass, do their job, check the spacecraft, make sure nothing happened prior to the last 24 hour contact and move on. So that's a, that's a very powerful thing for us. And the way that we made this all happen is we took a look at our application. We took a look at Nagios. They, they both do their things very well. And when we put them together, we now had some capabilities we could not have in the amount of time that combining these two gave us. We'd have to rewrite our, complete app, our application completely would have taken a huge amount of effort, a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of testing, and with schedules the way they are, we just don't have the luxury of time at this point. Nor would it really make sense when you can plug in an existing mature product and do that. Concept of keep it simple, can't stress that more. That is something that we live by, breathe by. Without it, we would be struggling quite a bit. Complicated systems, I have enough of those. Spacecraft are complicated. So keeping it simple makes my life easier and my team's easier. Make it modular, you saw 
what we did with the instances of now yes per satellite. That was key into being able to deploy this over time. Solaris and open source. Uh, I like Solaris, I've supported it over the years, but we try to use open source with it, it becomes very frustrating very quickly. Um, just getting Nagios to compile and run was, was a struggle. Hopefully it phases out soon out of our environment. Um, so I, I wish those, uh, those of you out there who still have Solaris the best of luck uh, moving forward. Then JSON everywhere, that's kind of a, a mantra one of my colleagues and I started a while back um, with some of the stuff we did on these projects. We each have our own favorite scripting languages and programming languages. In the past data back and forth between some of the stuff we work on, JSON just made sense. It was simple, um, it did the job, it encapsulated what we wanted to send back and forth. It just made life easier. So, that's my presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, some more pictures up here of our thermal vac chamber and some of our spacecraft. Let me know if, that, if you have any questions. I do suggest that you take a look at a website out there that, came, uh, that we came across a while back called stuffin.space if you want to see what's out there around the Earth. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's a nice visualization of all the spacecraft out there. It's pretty cool. We've actually used it in-house to do some of our visualization. Um, and we feed status from Algios to it so we can light up which spacecraft have problems, which ones don't. It's pretty cool. Thank you. So do we have any questions for Thomas? Right here. So my first, well, I'll say only question. Um, so for the sake of argument, if there's a system on the satellite that says, like I have uh, low voltage on a solar panel, for instance. ASCS sees that as a problem. Is it passing that information on to Nagios and relying on Nagios for the notification, or does ASCS do its own version of notification? It passes along to Nagios, and Nagios grabs that and notifies the appropriate spacecraft engineers to say, hey, you need to take a look at something. Okay, so ASCS is essentially just doing the, what was your word, decommuting? Uh, decommutating. De decommutating, there we go. Decommutating, it also applies what we call limits to the data, warning limits, critical limits, and then that's what gets passed on to Nagios. So from the engineering perspective, the spacecraft engineers and flight directors adjust those settings, and then they get passed along as either a warning, critical, or okay to Nagios. All right, so you're not doing thresholds within Nagios itself. You're getting that information yes. as part of that check. Fortunately, yes, okay. because with 221,000 data points, it would be outrageous. <laughs> I'm all over the room. Oh, yeah, I have two questions. Um, one to talk about um, why CheckMK multi-site install truck. Well, what, what's the reason behind you and we check them? MK multi-site instead of using Truck? So I wanted to use Truck, but at the time we deployed this, um, it was kind of a decision between do we want to see everything together in one view or do we want to see it in a tabbed view? Okay. And that was kind of the key difference that I saw between the two products. Um, and at the time, the full view was what our engineers kind of wanted. Got it. Yeah. And the second question is, can you talk a little bit about your high availability and load balancing of your centralized global Nagios? Uh, instance, and also out of those 220, 221,000 checks that you have, I believe most are passive services. Yes. Yes. Um, so, I mean, you may not be using any of the mod game and stuff or distributed monitoring. We do, we do some active monitoring with the actual application to make sure it's up and healthy. Um, it's kind of a combination between active and passive because of that message bus that wants to broadcast all the time. Um, as far as high availability goes with our COSC, um, group. Since they're not operating the spacecraft, we have a little lower requirement as far as availability because our actual customers, the satellite operators, do that job day in and day out. We're just kind of a shadow function for that. So if we go down, we're fine. They can continue to operate. So. Uh, and and how, I mean, how, 
how frequently the, this event creates and how frequently you process the events to the buffer, the FIFO file in NAG years? That's a good question. Because uh, I mean, I have this passive mode and I yeah. run, and sometimes NAG years stale because it's not able to process everything I'm processing to the FIFO, and I change my mode to use MKLIF status to process, or NSCA mm. to take it and queue it and then process it as it gets it. Mm -hmm. Because when I do it directly to the NAGIOS before, it stales. And I just want to know what are the challenges you faced and how did you accomplish I mean, So with this deployment, we're writing the content of status directly to the command file or command interface, so it gets processed pretty quickly. I am kind of concerned with the older Solaris servers. They do tend to have to work pretty hard. Uh, but so, I, so far, I haven't seen any, any real lag. It okay. seems to be keeping up with it. And I also have an instance on each server just to manage each spacecraft. So I split up kind of the workload that way. And how many you process event per minute or five, I mean, in terms of events? Are they real-time events that you keep getting then? They are real-time. Um, but if, if the spacecraft is happy and healthy, not too much is changing. Okay. So Got it. yeah, so it's manageable. Okay. And, and it varies just depending on um, where the spacecraft is in orbit, because throughout, throughout the season, there are eclipse periods that the spacecraft goes into. So then you get uh, voltages that change and temperatures that change. So we do see some events come up then. But if the engineers are doing their job correctly, the spacecraft engineers, um, everything should look nice and green. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So with all of the data points that you're, you're monitoring passively, uh, how do you guys handle kind of the throttling of all of that data coming in? Um, I would imagine there's a lot of data coming in very frequently. Is that what your uh, ASCS system does? Is it kind of like buffers it? And then you know, if, if you have like a sudden blip in a metric or something like that that spikes up, how do you keep from essentially missing that with such a steady feed of data all the time? So the about the only time we see a real flood of information is when we bring up the system and it broadcasts all the current status. But the way the message bus is designed, it only sends information when it gets updates or when things change. So again, it kind of goes back to if the spacecraft isn't really doing a lot, things really aren't changing too much. So it's, it's very manageable. Um, some data points update every second, some every couple seconds, so, and some never until there is a change. So surprisingly, it's, it's manageable. <laughs> uh, I have two questions for you. One is, it's, uh, it's not really a question, kind of an observation, but I like your take on it. It's a little bit different scenario than most people probably deal with. When we monitor systems, if we see a problem, we can usually fix those. You're in a little bit different situation where if a satellite does have a problem, you can't really reach out and touch it and fix a problem remotely. Um, and you also have a long ramp up time to replace a satellite that's starting to fail. Do, your, do a lot of your customers, you know, whether they're governments or corporations, do they, do they keep backup satellites in the sky to handle like a failover type situation? Some actually do. Um, if they need to, they may order a third one and get it up there and just kind of keep it just in case. Um, I think we've done that with NASA with some of their spacecraft. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a trade off between the investment of a spacecraft you're not using versus ones that you are. So it, depending on how much insurance you want to buy, um, some do, some don't. But I know our customers are constantly looking at their overall capacity across their fleets. And I'm sure that's always in the back of their mind. What do we do when this one starts going it's a, out? It's an expensive hot spare in this guy. You know, it is. Sitting. It is. Um, plus, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, plus with uh, some of the FCC regulations, you have to broadcast something from your spacecraft in order to keep the spot it's in. So you have to use it for something, if not just a little bit. The other question I had was, uh, you have an incredible amount of data points that you're monitoring per satellite. Um, you know, did you guys have to do any custom UI development to give your support staff a super high level overview and then allow them to drill in? I mean, that's a, a lot of data points that you're monitoring. 
It is, and we are currently working with our engineers to figure out what they want to see. Um, right now, we kind of brute force it with the multi-site view of it, but we've done some web development to kind of narrow that focus down. In fact, we've taken the stuff in space um, interface and also Google Maps and did kind of a, a look from the distance and a close-up look of the fleet. And we'll take all that data and just kind of narrow it down to either you know, a good, bad, or otherwise for the spacecraft. So kind of a first glance they can look at and see that the fleet's OK or maybe one spacecraft has an issue. So we're still working with them to kind of narrow that down and really focus on the things they care about. So there's some subsystems that they can kind of ignore for a while and not care about, but there's others that they really do care about. And if any of these spacecraft have an issue where they lose the capability to um, operate their payload, then all the customers out there in the world lose that service, and that's pretty critical. So you don't want to be sitting there watching the Disney Channel and have it go out for like an hour. You'd probably be pretty unhappy. Thanks. And before I forget, I have giveaways up here if anyone's interested. First off, that presentation was out of this world, so. Great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering, is there a place we can go to view upcoming launches of your satellites? There's a couple places. I believe our website has a list, although it doesn't really have dates. But at least you can see what's coming up. Um, Space Flight Now keeps track of some of that stuff. Um, the launch providers like ULA, ILS, um, SpaceX, they have their manifest. But I think space flight now is probably your best bet. Do we have any more questions? They're just flying up all over the place. <laughs> uh, one of the slides you had shown up there, it showed your uh, telemetry system coming in, which in turn passed it on to Nagios, and we'll call that uh, satellite A as Nagios A. Do you have a way to say, oh no, Nagios A went down, I want Nagios B to start taking over? We without do. manually going in and say, okay, I'm going to start doing this, and I'm going to start uh, receiving checks. We do have primary redundant servers for those applications, for the ASCS application, but it's an active standby configuration. Um, the nice thing about the message bus is Nagios doesn't know which one you're talking to. It's just subscribing to a service. So where I'd like to get is to the point where if one of those servers goes down, the other one comes up automatically. Uh, maybe have Nagios initiate that based on the event. Have it come up, reconnect, and just start doing its job again. That'd be great. We'll get there. I had another question up here. Uh, how custom is the, um, the hardware on the satellites themselves? Like, would you actually see any commodity, like x86 type hardware on a satellite, like an Intel <laughs> processor, or is it all very custom, and do you guys do that designing, or does your client? So to answer the first portion, commodity is very difficult because everything needs to be space hardened. If it's not, it doesn't last long. Uh, we had bought a small camera from like Radio Shack to take a look at some of the solar wing deployments a long time ago, and we knew it wouldn't last long in space, and sure enough, after a couple months, it just started breaking down. So it'd be nice if we could, um, but we can't. So we do in-house develop and design and build a lot of the components, but we also contract out to quite a few vendors um, for some of the more common components. Uh, the solar rings, I think, historically, we, built, we buy those from a company called Spectrolab, which was a spinoff from the company I first started with, which was Hughes Space and Com. So, a lot of history there. Um, yeah, pretty pretty custom stuff. And then the customers will give us requirements for the payload. They each have their own design and needs for their payload. So each of those are kind of unique. Okay. Uh, just curious on the uh, the network setup. Um, is each satellite kind of like its own subnet and has its own contained network that? talks IP and then sends down uh, satellite connectivity down to your Nagios servers? 
I wish it were that simple. Um, <laughs> what, what I didn't show up there with the telemetry connection was the satellite is hovering over a spot on Earth, and there's antennas dedicated to that spacecraft that collect the data that comes down. It's, it's all ones and zeros. There's, it's not a standard format, you would, you would think. But that's why we need to get it to the ground and convert it into TCP IP and feed it into our system. So that's a little leg in there that was missing. And those sites are all over the world. Um, mostly customer owned uh, for the long term operations, but during mission support, we'll contract with vendors and use assets as the spacecraft goes around the world. It's pretty cool. Any more questions? Well, this was a, nope. we got, got a one more. Right. couple more. Oh, oh. Hey there. Um, so first, I'm, I'm very sorry you have to work with Solaris. Uh, my condolences on that. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> you've mentioned that you had problems compiling stuff on the Solaris machines. Now, as far as I understood it, uh, your software runs on Solaris and then calls onto the Nagy server, which runs on Fedora. So I'm wondering what sort of compilations do you have to do? So I end up compiling Nagios on the Solaris server with the application. So that's where I ran into a lot of challenges, and this was several years ago, just trying to get it to compile and run correctly. Um, I was able to do it, but it took a lot of time and effort trying to find all the different packages for Solaris. Um, I think I ran into an issue with the live status software being compatible on Solaris with Nagios. So just little things like that that just drive you crazy. That should be simple, but sometimes aren't. Running on Spark or Intel? I'm sorry? Um, the processor, is this uh, running on Solaris Spark or Spark. Intel? Yep. Probably A2. Um, surprisingly, 10. Oh, wow. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> and I think they're T5220s or something like that. OK, cool. I hope, to, I, I hope to hear you move to Linux soon. Me too. Me too. <laughs> and great presentation, by the way. Thank you. So we, we have time for one more question, if you have one. What's the timeline for Nagios 4 upgrades? And do you really prefer to go, I mean, obviously you have to go for upgrade because support is start for Nagios 3. Um, my plan is as soon as possible. But it's going to be on Solaris? It will be. I know. I, I'm afraid to go down that path again. Um, I did see in one of the release notes that there is some hope. I think, uh, I think you guys had compiled it on Solaris, or there was some rumor. So I'm hopeful that it's not as difficult. And it'll definitely help us because of the performance enhancements yes. and efficiencies. Yeah. yeah. Definitely on the Linux, two uh, spacecraft that run on Linux, they'll, they'll go straight to version 4. Got it. Yeah. Well, that was about as perfect of a start as we could have. We used up every every moment of our Q&A time. We got all the questions. There. We got some celestial comedy back in the back there that was good. <laughs> all right, once again, Thomas Schmeinde.